Greetings, family. I'm Pastor Andre Jefferson, Jr., the proud pastor here at New Mount Olive AME Church in Chesapeake, Virginia. Unfortunately, this past Sunday, we had a medical emergency happen and we were unable to complete our live stream of our worship service. However, there is still a word from the Lord. This past Sunday, we had, we had to wrestle with and sit with the question sermonically, what shall we say to these things? How many of us, all of us know today that life sometimes will leave you with more questions than answers. Sometimes we're left to sit and have to live with life's unanswered questions. However, the good news and throughout all of that is that we serve a God that is close enough to us to sit with us as we have to live with life's unanswered questions. And not only will that God sit with us, but God, that God is close enough to us for us to pull on God's shirt collar until our questions end up becoming our exclamations and our exclamations then end up becoming our life's declarations of God's ability, even in the midst of our uncertainty. So stay tuned in. And as we answer this question, what shall we say to these things? God bless you. Scripture, we're going to go right into the sermon today. There is still a word from the Lord. And I believe that what God has to say today is still fitting for this moment. This moment that will leave some that leaves some of us with more questions than answers. This moment that sometimes leaves our faith a little fuzzy right now. This moment that even right now that might that might cause for us to feel a little type of way. I want us to hear these victorious words found in Romans chapter eight, verse number verse thirty one, read so eloquently in your hearing by Sister Ida Cromwell. The text reads like this: It says, "What then shall we say?" To these things, if God is for us, who is against us? What then shall we say to these things? When situations like what just happened right now come up, what are we to say to these things? When we have turmoil in our souls and turmoil in our spirit, what can we say to these things? King James Version said it like this, if God be for us, who can stand against us? If you would pray with me for a few moments, we're going to preach on the sermon topic of what shall we say to these things? What shall we say to these things? Uh, Romans chapter 8 is the Magna Carta of the New Testament. This book and this chapter contain some of the best one-liners of the New Testament. In this chapter, we find most, if not all of, our favorite scriptures. Romans 8, chapter 8, verse number 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verse number 15, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, Romans chapter 8, verse number 18, for I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 through 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth us in our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings and moanings which cannot be uttered in Romans chapter 8 verse 28 everybody's favorite scripture and we know that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord to them who are called according to his purpose Romans chapter 8 contains some of our most favorite and most hopeful scriptures which is why we are in this particular passage right now Romans chapter 8, verse 31 says this, What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? You know, Sister Copeland, I find the scripture interesting because it begins the conclusion of a grand thought. Paul honestly could have ended this letter at any one of these great scriptures and it would be impactful. However, Paul began to end this letter to the church in Rome with a question, what then shall we say to these things? 
And while whenever we typically read this text, that question brings us some hope, sometimes when we go through life and go through life seasons, it's left you to ask that same kind of question. What can we say to these things? When you look at our political climate right now, what shall we say to these things when a convicted felon is still a viable candidate for presidential office? What shall we say to these things when even our own a local elected government is playing petty politics all because they see a threat to their power? What shall we say to these things when as, school, when as the school year starts, students aren't just greeted by teachers, but they're greeted by guns and mass shootings as well? What shall we say to these things? What shall we say to these things when every single time it seems as if every time you turn on the news, that crimes that you would never have thought were possible are being reported on. What shall we say to these things? What shall we say to these things when we get another devastating diagnosis? What shall we say to these things when no matter how much you try to budget and save, that it's never enough for your monthly budget? What shall we say to these things when life's problems just seem to overwhelm you? What shall we say? To these things, Paul asks this question, and as we end, with, and as we end one week and begin another, we are left to ponder this question as well: What shall we say to these things? This is a question that is not only asked when this is a question that is only asked when you are left speechless. When something that has happened in your life has rocked you to your core and you can't even fathom an answer to what has happened or taken place, what shall we say to these things? You ever been there, family? Experienced something or seen something and it left you asking the question, what shall we say to these things? If you haven't, then you will because you can go through some things so rough that the only response to the rough reality that you are living in is the question, what shall we say to these things? When the doctor is telling, telling you one, one terminal illness and after another, what shall we say to these things? When you, you can be so disappointed by people and by your life that the only response is, what shall we say to these things? You can be so hurt that your only response is, what can we say to these things? You can experience betrayal so bad that your only response is, what shall we say to these things? You can suffer so much that your only response to what's happening is what shall we say to these things? This question is interesting because it is asked in the context of a heavy and a hopeful chapter. Paul is writing and talking to the church in Rome about the rough reality of the saints. That is that every saint is going to experience some suffering. I know none of us in here like to suffer, myself included, but unfortunately suffering is a lived reality for the saint. In this life, you will have tribulation. In this life, you might have the wind knocked out of you. You might be left speechless in some of your prayers. You will experience a level of discomfort. However, Paul does not leave us in, not in the midst of our suffering. Paul always reminds us in the midst of our suffering that suffering is not the end of journey. Paul reminds us throughout this whole entire chapter that there is a God that will help you, save you, and deliver you, and keep you in the midst of your suffering, and that suffering is not the only thing that is possible in your life, but glory and greater glory is possible in your life as well. This chapter is heavy. This chapter is heavy, and the chapter is hopeful. You ever been there? It's a dualistic dichotomy of existence, a heavy and a hopeful type of chapter. You ever had that experience in your life where life is heavy and hopeful all at the same time? 
been in a season where things were heavy and hopeful, it's hopeful because you've seen God bless you in one area of your life only for it to be heavy in another another area of your life just seemingly fall apart. It's hopeful because you're watching God open doors for you on your job, but it's heavy because when you come home, it seems like all hell is breaking loose. It's hopeful because at home, life is going well. Kids are doing great and the spouse is doing well, but it's heavy because your co-workers and supervisor get on your one last black nerve. It's hopeful and it's heavy. It's hopeful because financially you may be doing well but heavy because physically you are not. It's hopeful because you just got saved and joined the church but heavy because now everything that could go wrong has gone wrong. You ever been there family? In a heavy and a hopeful season? In a season that left you with more questions than answers? A heavy and a hopeful season. In a season like that, if you're in a season like that, if you're in a season that has left you with more questions than answers, you need to do one key thing, and that is this, don't rush to find an answer. Peep the text, y'all. Paul asks two questions in verse 31 that I think are really important. Paul asks a heavy question and he asks a hopeful question. Paul asks, what then shall we say to these things? That's a heavy question. The hopeful question, if God is for us, then who can be against us? And Paul does one key thing that I think all of us as the believers need to be able to do in our lives. Paul does not drive, Paul does not let the questions of his life drive him to search for an answer that he may never have. Which lets me know that sometimes the best thing we can do in life is not just sit with the certainty of an answer, but sit with the uncertainty of the questions. Because life has a way of leaving you with more questions than answers. And you have to find a way to sit with the silence of an unanswered question. An unanswered question that will leave you pondering the thought, what can I say to these things? You know, this isn't just about sitting with the silence of an unanswered question. This is also about not rushing to an answer. Because you'll find that there is no answer to the first question in verse number 31. This is important because oftentimes we move in certainties. You would have thought that with Paul, that the natural response to a question would be a response. That when Paul says, what shall we say to these things, there would have been a definitive and definite answer. But Paul says, Paul responds to his question with a question. And oftentimes, that's what life does to us. Life will give you one question and force you to respond to that one question with another question and leave you with another question after that. And that's not how we like to live our lives. We like to move with definites. We like to know that we know that we know that we know. We like to be sure and certain. And what Paul is teaching us here is that you don't always need to rush to an answer that sometimes you need to just sit with the question. Here's how I know. Um, when I was in college, I had a music theory final where the last question on the test was worth 30 points. Uh, Mr. 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 Copa, my, my professor, knowing that there was a lot on the line for this test, allowed for the final to be open book. Now, this excited me because I was confident and I was confident because I took copious notes. I mean, Mr. Mr. Peterson, I was a student in this class that didn't just, they tell you to write, not write in the margins. My notes were in the margins, in the corners, on the front cover, on the back cover, on, on, on a post-it note, on the back of my, I took notes every single place that I could. I was a student that took notes in the margin. I took notes on a notebook and on Google Drive. I even recorded the lectures and I saved all of my study guides. I was confident that I was going to do well on this final since it was now open book. And when I got the final, I had my notebook, I had all my notes, had all my study guides, and as I'm going doing this final, I'm basing it. Ooh, I'm moving quickly through this final. I'm telling you right, let me tell you right here and right now, y'all, there was not a question that I didn't that I didn't have an answer for until I got to that last question. When I got to that 30-point question, I was stumped. 
because I had never been asked this question for in class. I didn't have the notes for this question. There was nothing that I had reference for in my notebook for this question. There was nothing that, 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 that had prepared me for this particular question. I had, a, I had a lot of notes, but I didn't have enough notes to help me answer this question. And I had to sit with the question that I could not figure out. And sometimes in life, you'll have to sit with questions that you just can't figure out. Sometimes in life, you'll have to sit with the question that leaves you with more questions. Sometimes in life, you'll have to wrestle with the silence of an unanswered question. But that's not the only news I came to deliver to you today. The good news is that when you sit in the silence of an unanswered question, you don't sit by yourself. The good news is that you've got a God that you can call on. That whenever you are sitting in the silence of an unanswered question, it doesn't mean that you are sitting there by yourself on punishment. No, you are not in spiritual time out. But the good news is that just because life gave you a question that you don't have the answer to, that does not mean that you don't necessarily have a person that you can call on to help you answer that question. Romans chapter 8 verse 15 says we got a father that we can call on. Abba, Father, that when I'm going through, I can just call on God. When I don't have an answer to life's questions, I can just call on God. When I can't figure my, figure my way out, I can just call on God. When I'm stumbling and stumped by what's happened in my life, if I just call on God, God will help me. God will see me through. God will guide me. God will just sit with you. As a matter of fact, that ain't just good for you to call on Abba, Father, but sometimes life will not the life out of you and you can't even get enough breath to ask the question why this has happened in your life and when your life circumstances have left you with the questions when life and circumstances has forced you to ask what then can I say to this thing that's happened this torment that's happened this trouble that's happened this tribulation that's come into my life the good news is that you not only can call on Abba Father but you've got the Holy Spirit that will interpret your moans and your groans and your utterances and bring those before God and I know it's been a rough point before the sermon but can I let you know can we get at least a two and a half folk in here today that can praise God because you didn't sit with life's unanswered questions by yourself you weren't left to sit with life's un to wrestle with life's tough questions alone that you didn't have to sit in silence by yourself but you had a God that you could call on, a God that could interpret your tears, interpret your cries, interpret your utterances, interpret your I don't knows. And you got a God that didn't just leave you there by yourself, but you had a God that was able to hold you through life's uncertainty. And the good news is that when you find yourself lacking for an answer, God will hold you through what's uncertain. God will keep you through that uncertain season. When you don't know which way to go, when you don't know up from down, when you're trying to find the answers to what has happened in your life, when you're trying to figure out why in the world am I going through this? Why did this have to happen to me? I'm here to let you know the day that you've got the kind of God that won't just let you go through it on your own, but God will walk with you through it. God won't just walk with you through it. God will keep you through it. God will guide you through it. God will help you through it, give you peace through it. God will give you rest through it. And that's good news today. And the good news also is this, is that when you're lacking an answer, God is the one that holds you and keeps you through it. So when you read this text again, you ought to read it with a little bit more confidence in your life. So what shall we say to these things, if God be for us, who can stand against us? You know, this text, Sister Hankins, is really interesting. It's interesting because if you read it in the King James Version, you would think that Paul was illiterate because of how the, the King James Version uses that word to be. Peep the text, y'all. In the King James Version, it says, Paul says, if God be now, Sister Copeland, you always get on top of me with my grammar, so I had to make sure I checked the grammar in the text. 
And so here's, here's, here's why this alarms me a little bit. And it should alarm some of you all as well, because we don't typically use, we don't typically paste to place the verb be after pronouns. If we did, if we did that, then our sentences would sound like this: I be going to the store. I be going to the mall. And that's not how we were all taught to talk. So I asked, I had to have a little conversation with Paul, and I said, Paul, why in the world did you use this verb to be here? And Paul said, well, Reverend Jefferson, I needed to remind the people that in the midst of your troubles, that when you have troubling times, when you're going through tribulation, it can sometimes feel as if that God is not on your side. Sometimes it can feel as if that when, when you're going through certain troubles, that God may not even be on your side, and that sometimes God may not even exist. And so I had to remind people that God be for them. And I said, that still doesn't make no sense. He said, listen to the grammar. The verb to be literally, it literally means, talks about a verb of existence. And so I had to remind people that in the midst of your trouble, that when you feel as if that life is against you, when you feel as if that every single thing is coming up against you, I had to remind them that there is a God that exists for them. And the reason why some of us didn't get our shout cue yet is because we are still up here trying to figure out how in this world does this, does this but this is work out for me. And I'm here to let you know right now that there is a God out here that is existing for you. That God is that God exists for you to get the victory. God exists for you to see the other side. God exists for you to end up being better. God exists for you to end up not struggling with that with life's swift transitions. God exists for you to make sure that you make it out all right. And that's the good news, some good news today because God existence has been able to answer some of the questions in my life. God's existence has been able to take care of some of the things that have happened in my life. As a matter of fact, God's existence has changed and made the difference in my life. God's existence has allowed for me to be more confident in this life. And that's good news right there. And here, and here, what Paul does is Paul says, I had to remind the Roman church because they were going through some tribulation and some trials. Put in the perspective, the Roman church was dealing with uh, persecution from their, from their emperor Nero. The, per, the Roman church was not just dealing with persecution from Nero, but they're catching it from the, so, from the political standpoint and from the social standpoint as well. They're catching it on every side. Their church is up under attack. They are up under attack, and they're trying to figure out how in the world are we going to make it through this after everything that we've been through, all that we've done, all that we've experienced, all the suffering that we're having to endure, is God really even for us and on our side? And Paul had to remind them that if God is for you, that you've got the kind of God that is for you, that God is on your side, that God has never left you, that God has not forsaken you, and that if you have a God that is on your side, then you can make it through any and everything that you go through. And that's good news right there, family. Because all of us have dealt with something in our lives that has seemingly tried to take us out. All of us have dealt with something in our lives that have seemingly tried to, tried to, tried to defeat us. All of us have dealt with issues that have caused us to feel defeated. All of us have dealt with something that, seem, that makes it seem as if that it is impossible. But here Paul reminds us that we have a God that is on our side. That if God exists for you, that if God is for you, then God is with you. And if you got God and God's got you, then nothing can stand against you. And I think there are some folk in here today that know that and have experienced God having them when everything came up against them. There are some folk in here that have experienced God having them when sickness came up against them. There are some folk who have experienced God being for them when everything else came up against them. There are some folk in here who have experienced God being on their side when everybody else has left their side. There are some folk in here that know what it's like and have experienced God standing with them when everyone 
else has stood against them. And I believe there are some folk in here today that can testify that because God was on my side, what came against me couldn't stand against me. The weapons formed, but they couldn't prosper because God was on my side. The enemy came in like a flood, but their plans didn't succeed because God was on my side. And I didn't have, I did have the life and the wind knocked out of me, but I didn't stay down for long because God was on my side. Is there anybody in here that can praise God? Because they've got God that's on their side. So, so Paul writes this verse with two questions. But it's interesting because that's not really how we read this text. Sister Ida, you read it so perfectly and so eloquently. I love how you read it because we don't read this text like there's, like there's a question and another question. We read this text like there's a question and an exclamation point. Let, 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 me, make, let me say it one more time. We don't read this text like there are two questions. We read this text like there's one question and an, exclamat- and an, and an exclamatory response. Let me, make, let me make it plain. Help us out here. The great theologian Howard Thurman says that we as black Christians have always been able to take the hard questions of life and the theological questions of life and reach up towards heaven and yank and tug on life's questions until it straightens out to become an exclamation point. And when we are left to ask this question, is there a bomb in Gilead, we yanked on it as people and tugged on it and pulled on it until that question mark straightened out and we exclaimed that there is a palm in Gilead. When, when, we, when we were left to ask the question, does God care about the righteous? We reached up towards heaven and yanked on that question until it became an exclamation point and we said, yes, God does care for the righteous and this text is no different. We have taken this text and read it, not like it's a question, but we read it with an exclamation point because if God is for us, who can be against us? So that it no longer exists as a question. This this verse exists as a battle cry, a rallying cry, when we deal with more than we are able to handle. If God mm, is for us, who can be against us? And I don't know who I'm talking to in here. I don't know who I'm preaching to today. I don't know who I'm talking to today. But I don't know who needs to hear this today. But if you just reach up towards heaven in faith, And if you yank hard enough, God will give you an answer. God will give you something that will sustain your soul through the turmoil. So if you reach up towards heaven and you're trying to figure out, will this situation work out in my favor? Just reach up towards heaven and keep yanking until you can exclaim that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to God's purpose. If you're if you're sitting in a hospital bed and you're wondering, God, when in the world would I ever be healed? God, am I ever going to see through this? God, am I ever going to stop dealing with this headache. God, am I ever going to stop dealing with this health issue? Just keep reaching up towards heaven and yank on that question until you exclaim that yes, I am healed. How long, God, must I suffer? How long must I have to endure? How long must I have to deal with and go through this crazy, tumultuous, and troubling situation? If you have that question, all you got to do is reach up towards heaven and keep yanking on that question until you exclaim that weeping may endure for a night but joy joy comes in the morning and I'm glad I know that some of our college students are on their way back on campus and some of them are asking the question right now in the first semester am I even going to make it out of school? Am I even going to get through this? Can I even pass this class? Keep pulling on that question mark and keep asking God that question until you exclaim that yes I made it I made it over and I will make it all right turn to your neighbor and say neighbor oh neighbor if I keep pulling and keep yanking on God 
God will answer my question and hear my cry. That's why your praise and your worship is so important. Because praise and worship is just like my son. Whenever he wants something from me, he keeps tank yanking and tanking and pulling on my pants leg trying to figure out, Daddy, when are you going to pay attention to me? Daddy, when are you going to see what I'm in need of? Daddy, when are you going to going to answer my prayer. Daddy, when are you going to see me through? And he keeps on pulling until I look down and say, son, I got you. And that's exactly what your praise and worship does to God. When you lift up your holy hands, when you lift up your hands to heaven, it's like you're yanking on God's stroke of a pants leg, trying to say, God, when you're going to see me through? God, when you're going to take care of me? God, God, when you're going to help me out? God, when you're going to see me through? And you keep on tugging and keep on pulling and keep on pulling on God's pants leg until God turns around and says, I'm going to take care of you. And that's why when you pull, reach up and yank on down, you can get the exclamation point that God said that God will supply all my needs and keep me through every single trial and struggle if you know it say yes say yes and that's why you got to reach up to heaven and keep pulling on God's co a coattail because when you do God will take your questions and turn them into exclamation points so that you can begin to boast about God's goodness in your life because when I was wondering if I was ever going to be forgiven for all the crazy stuff I might have done in my life if I was wondering if I ever would be forgiven for how things have turned out in my life all I had to do was reach up and ask God, God, would you forgive me? And God reached and looked down and said, I got grace and mercy for you. And when I reached up and pulled that last time, the exclamation point, the question mark became an exclamation point. And so that I said, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And that's right there. It's a good news for you because when you reach up you got to pull down so that God can see you through if you know it says yes. come on stand up all over the church everybody stand up all over the church everybody